Hi, Misha here, and quite recently I did kind of an overview, a bit of a deep dive, just general history with commentary on American small arms of World War II. The 1903, the M1 Grand, the M1 Carbine, the Thompson, etc. This time we're going to look at Soviet small arms of the war, the Great Patriotic War, World War II, the Eastern Front, and there are some surprising things here with the Russian guns, and some not surprising. Now, I do want to say that they'll probably go on a short break. Um, everyone, I, I, when I did the other video, I said I was sick. I'm, I'm pretty much over it. Now everyone around me is sick. Um, even people I haven't seen in a couple of weeks, so I didn't make them sick. It's just going around here. Uh, and it seems like it's a bug that takes a week or two to get over. Like, J-Row just called in sick yesterday. Before that, another person who helped me calls in sick. So, we'll see where it goes. So, there might be a short break, but I've actually got four or five guns ready to go to the range, and I'm actually excited to shoot them. A couple of new ones you haven't seen yet. But in the interim, I wanted to give you a video to chew on this week. Well, hopefully everyone recovers and takes their antibiotics from the doc. So... Wish everyone good luck so I can get back out. But this seemed like a fun one to do. I'll be talking about the guns. I'll also be kind of going to black box mode here and there to break things up and also give some personal story time accounts of the guns. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to Patreon. Otherwise, like, share, or subscribe. With that, let's dive in. And before we get started, I mentioned Patreon there. I actually have a poll up at the moment for Patreons to pick the next country to kind of do this overview of. Really just putting these videos up in between other projects to have something and just to chat with you guys, give some story times. But yeah, if you're interested, sign up on Patreon. A buck, you can vote. I'll try to do more polls, let people pick, because I always like new ideas. So with that, let's dive in and begin with this, my SVT-40, because this really kind of shows us the ambition and the goals of the Red Army prior to the German invasion, June 22, 1941. Believe it or not, alongside the USA, the Soviet Union, the USSR, Russia, really was at the forefront of self-loading military rifles, at least ones intended for mass production and general adoption mass issuance. And this goes all the way back to even before World War I, because Fyodor Tokarev, who designed this, hit one of his earliest efforts at a self-loading gun was a conversion of a mosin Nagant 91, all the way back around 1910, 1911. Of course, it didn't go anywhere. But in the middle of World War I, there was the 1916 Fedorov, often credited as the world's first assault rifle or battle rifle. Interestingly, it was chambered for 6.5 Arasaka because Russia had quite a few Arasakas in that war and because it was a lighter cartridge than Russia's common 762 by 54 r And that's because the 1916 was select fire. Now, they did not make many under Tsarist Imperial Russia before, you know, the brief democratic government and the ousting of all that. And then, of course, you get into the Bolsheviks taking over. But a few more were made during the uh, early 1920s under communism. So it did go into production. Although I would argue that the French RSC 1917 really beat it as far as like mass issuance and making it to the front, but I digress. So that kind of shows the early efforts, and Tokarev himself actually studied under and learned from Fedorov. As it happens, Mikhail Kalashnikov also credits Fedorov, his book, with inspiring the famous AK. So that kind of gives us there. And while in the early 20s, as the Bolsheviks were reorganizing the Red Army, they decided to kind of focus on bolt actions, but trials would continue for self-loading rifles, especially as Stalin took over, because 
This was a bit of a special interest for Stalin. Early on, leading the charge, you still had Fedorov for a few years in the 20s, and Tokarev. But around 26, 27, this young upstart newcomer started to put his two cents in, Sergei Simonov of later SKS fame. Either way, they would go back and forth, several trials, nothing adopted, several models, they tried gas trap, pistons, all kinds of things. Finally, by 1934, it was down to the wire with Tokarev's latest self-loading rifle and Simonov's. And in 1935, late in that year, it was recommended to adopt Simonov's design, and it would be selected in 1936. And that would be the AVS-36, which translates essentially to Automatic Rifle Simonov. And I don't have one, because for one, they're select fire, and for another, they didn't make that many. I do have this, though. A 118 scale that looks like it's supposed to be an AVS-36 with the scope on it. Yeah, over on my personal Misha channel, I recently reviewed some um, World War II figures, Russian, American, German, Chinese, and uh, they actually came with this set. I don't know, yeah. Notice the long mag, though. The uh, AVS-36 had a 15-round mag as standard. Of course, it was firing 762 by 54 rimmed, which the Soviets had settled on. They knew it had some shortcomings, but hey-ho, it was what it was. And the gun was quite long, too. It was over 49 and a half inches, and it weighed nigh on 10 pounds. But it was select fire, 54R, and the intention was to put the AVS-36 into mass production, eventually giving one to most frontline infantry squads. And production would ramp up at Ishesk, and by 1937, it was essentially in full-scale production, although it never really got that far. Really, primary production of the AVS-36 was discontinued by the end of 1938 because it already had issues. It was complicated. The, the bolt system, the feed path, was very steep. It had reliability issues, durability issues, mostly, again, because of the cartridge. It was maybe just a little ambitious, and Simonov really hadn't quite perfected his system yet. The system that would eventually evolve into the SKS, you know, the short stroke with the tilting. But either way, um, it needed more, more maturity. And also, Stalin was personal friends with Fyodor Tokarev, so... That always helps. So by late, late 1938, there were, had been new trials, and this time they were just going to go with self-loading, not necessarily automatic, just you know, single shot. And this time, Tokarev submission won. It was recommended at the end of 38. It was approved by Stalin, surprise, surprise, in 1939, becoming the SVT-38, essentially self-loading rifle Tokarev, or semi-automatic rifle if you prefer, Tokarev, model 1938. And by the summer of 1939, it was put into production at Tula, and soon to be joined later that year by Ishesk, and Tula would ramp up production. So, two factories making the SVT-38, then the Winter War happens. What's interesting about the Winter War, both the older AVS-36 and the, at the time, new SVT-38 would go there. Now, they would actually keep building AVS-36s up till about 1940, but this is just using up existing parts. In total, they built roughly 65,000. Not a tiny number, guys. Not huge, but not a tiny number. But both rifles proved to not be fantastic in the Winter War between November and March of 1940. And so that's where you get this model here, the SVT-40. So what were the perceived issues with the SVT-38 in the Winter War? Well, it was felt to be too fragile, Maybe a little too long still, even though it was shorter than the AVS. And 
One thing they were having trouble with, especially using gloves, was dumping the magazine. Here's the catch here. And by the way, these are 10 round mags. That was the really only type made. Notice it does have a slight curve. And they would typically issue one in the gun and then a pouch with two additionals. And they could be topped off by five round moisten stripper clips or chargers for our British friends. So yeah, they would, and I could understand that. This is a relatively big catch. It's not protected. You know, and dropping a mag for us at the range is annoying. But when you're in the snow and forest and trees and... Yeah, I can understand that issue. So, in April of 1940, right after the end of the Winter War, a not terribly happy Stalin essentially pressed to have uh, production of the SVT-38 suspended. And there would be new trials already underway at this point. Some in the military, who had always kind of preferred the Semenov design, said that, look, we're already set up to make the ABS, you know, we tried the SVT-38, you maybe go with uh, what he's doing. This had been an argument going on since the late 1938 you know, period. And Simonov himself, in 1939, had already claimed to have corrected the deficiencies and had new prototypes ready. So there was a push to switch back to an updated Simonov. But Tokarev too had corrected many of the issues, and it too was in production by this point, and again, friend of Stalin... So essentially, he got his final chance at this point. And it was accepted, put into initial production July of 1940. And that would be at Tula initially. A short time later, Ichesk and Podolsk would join in. So now we have three factories making the new SVT-40. What are the differences between the 38 and the 40? Internally, they're the same or at least close enough, it doesn't matter. The receiver was ever so slightly shortened on the 40 versus the 38, but it's still a short-stroke gas piston and a tilting, tipping bolt. Now, down here, we add the folding mag catch to lock the mag in place, and it's actually pretty easy to unfold. And what's kind of neat is when you insert the mag rather forcefully... In theory, it should slap it up, although we don't see it as much here. Oh, well. But, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of the PPSH-41. You get it raw here. <laughs> yeah, and this is something they had started with the SVT-38. They had rails on each side of the receiver for hopes of a scope. Although it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't have the cutout for it to lock in, but you could add that for the sniper versions they were hoping. The stock was made a single piece stock versus a two piece. The forearm itself was shortened. We have this corrugated two piece metal part up here. We went from two barrel bends to one. We moved the cleaning rod from the side of the stock to underneath the barrel. All of these changes were done to try to make it stronger, more durable, especially in the stock. Also save a little weight. They even shortened the muzzle brake. This is the original so-called fish gill brake on this one. It's actually slightly shorter. Blade bayonet lug, of course. One thing I think is kind of neat, there is a button that actually retains the cleaning rod. And these early examples, this one's a 1940 are actually made with a high degree of quality. And this was really pushing Russian technology at the factories at the time. First introduced with the 38, we have an adjustable gas system, but to keep people from accidentally moving it or just fiddling with it, it does actually take a special tool. Not a hard thing to do though, but that, that's not a bad thing for a military gun. The muzzle brake is actually quite effective too which it really is needed, because this is a relatively light gun. Um, it's about 48 and a quarter inches long, and it weighs in at uh, roughly eight and a half pounds. So they did save some weight over the AVS-36 and even the SVT-38. Of course, our safety's here. 
it's interesting when you flip it down it actually blocks the trigger cut out in the stock it's an automatic only this one is an early like I said so I put a leather sling on it which most early ones have and that was what was put into production in mid-1940 and they had big ambitions they wanted to be a, making two million every year by 1942 keep in mind there were there are three factories and they wanted to have a, a marksman a DMR a sniper variant and they wanted this to be replacing a, a wide number of other guns quite frankly and in the first year they were well underway by the end of 1940 over 70,000 of the new SVT 40s had been built I should point out that we don't know exactly how many 38s had been built but low end 100,000 high end 150,000 so between the AVS and the SVT 38 we had you know 150 to 200,000 self-loading rifles in service before that so not bad reciprocating handle right side last round hold open which is pretty advanced for the time super clips like I said a much shallower feed path compared with the uh, older guns and it does hold open when a mags removed of course there's no external button to release it but it is very smooth so it's a pretty modern mag system and a, and a pretty good positive safety the triggers on these are military but not horrible hammer fired easy enough to get to the gas piston for cleaning easy enough to get to your bolt group to take it out latch in the back pretty standard semi pistol grip stock my point is even issuing these with three mags this was a pretty forward thinking gun for its day and time the things that held it back were its caliber, its cartridge, 7.62x54R. That was more of a logistical thing. For some reason, the U.S. used 30 6 I wouldn't say it's weight. Its weight's not the issue. It is a long gun, though. So, length and caliber, and then finally, relative complexity. But we'll get to that later. Of course, any self-loading rifle is going to be more complicated than a bolt action. So... This is what they were going to war with in 1941. By June of 1941, as many as one-third and some units had SVT 38s or 40s in the Red Army. And they were very quickly approaching their production goals. And they could have reached it by 1942, but of course, the Germans it was pretty successful but it wasn't the only new gun in service in fact you know there was another one also from Dokarev and is actually what makes his name more famous today but first we need to briefly touch on this the model 1895 Nagant revolver this was in service through both world wars is the classic Russian revolver even though it was actually designed in Belgium in the first uh, 20,000 or so were built there but by night excuse me by 1899 Tula was producing these under license and that would continue throughout the wars although simplifications would happen early on grips could be walnut or birch had a uh, roughly four and a half inch barrel, overall length a little over 10 inches, and weighed about a pound and a half, a little more unloaded. This is what my notes say. So you had double, single action for officers, or just single action only for NCOs and other low lives. <laughs> yeah. It was a loading gate system, seven shots with a swing out ramrod to get the cartridges. It fired 762 by 38 rimmed, 30 caliber, and 
its really unique feature was that the cylinder moves forward to try to make a gas seal between the cylinder and the barrel, the cone, to try to get more velocity. And it did, although was it really worth it? You know, I would say it's a complicated system, but the Russians proved it's, it's really not. It's very simple. They only had to serialize a handful of number of parts, sometimes as few as three. Notice the uh, half moon side on this one. It was a dependable gun, and so when the Bolsheviks took over, they kept it in production at Tula. They got rid of the whole double single action slash single action only, just going to you know one size fits all in the early 20s. They also started installing the Tula Star and uh, the CCP marking by 1924. And so these were very much in production, but it's a revolver. We want something new and modern. I looked, and this is the best example I have for an early style TT-33, so pay no attention to the Polish markings, grips, or the old hole for the safety, which I swear one day I will actually get plugged. Regardless, yes, the Tokarev pistol. Tula Tokarev. In late 1930, trials for a new service sidearm to be an automatic were announced. They began in early 1931, and from quite early on, Tokarev's submission was an early favorite, and so around 1,000 were ordered for field testing and trials that would be built at Tula. They had a few early issues, like the heat treating wasn't quite right, so there had to be a little bit of a recall in 1933. But this was Tula learning. This is when Tula is modernizing. Up to this point, they had the old kind of pre-World War I style mills and power systems, and they would get new lathes and technology, and they were learning how to do it, including heat treat. So in 1933, it would really go into full-scale production first as the TT-30, which this is not. Between 1934 and 1936, simplifications and streamlining of production occurred for example, the removable back strap and the frame that was removed, so you could just have a solid frame back here. The machining of the barrel, locking lugs was simplified. The uh, trigger group, the fire control group system, modular packet was simplified. Either way, there's a transitional series, and by 1936, sometimes some say late 1935, the TT-33 replaces the TT-30. But really, it's kind of a pre-production versus full production example because, um, you know, it was a learning experience. And if you count the transitional models, and they built a little over 90,000 TT-30s, so they were around. But what is this gun here? This fires 762 by 25 Tokarev, which is basically a souped-up 763 Mauser because Russians like the broom handle. Bottleneck cartridge, they'll 30 caliber. In fact, in the 30s, all Russian guns were 30 caliber, at least small arms. It um, uses a modified, simplified Browning 1911 style locking system. Last round hull open. But in other ways, it's very much inspired by the earlier 1903 Browning, which Sweden adopted as the 1907. Eight round single stack mag, nothing fancy there, Browning style release, single action only. Obviously not a beveled mag well as I just showed. The reason I picked the Polish here is the uh, large serrations and the relatively high quality polished blued finish. Bakelite style grips, although the Russian one would have stars in them. And, of course, no safety, except for the ones needed for import here. The only safety we had was a half cock on the trigger. So, and that was done really just to save time and machining. And, hey, the revolver didn't have a safety. One is this automatic. And it was designed for mass production, obviously. And just simplicity it is a very modular gun. There actually are no screws in it. And it uses split pin pins instead of something a little more complicated. So it was really built 
designed, I should say, to be built on as basic a tooling as possible, but also to withstand the recoil of the pretty souped up 762-25 cartridge. It's a heavier than a Nagant revolver, it, just under two pounds. It has about the same barrel length, right over four and a half inches, but it is shorter at just over seven and a half inches. And of course you get eight plus one if you want to load one in the chamber versus a total of seven in the revolver and it's the old loading gate style at that. So it was a marked improvement. But I will say, 95 production was not completely suspended even in the 1930s, even if emphasis was placed on the TT-3033. This was still kind of ramping up by 1941. But they did have a goodly number in service by the time the Germans came in. Roughly uh, 600,000 of the new automatic, but of course that would join about a million of the old revolvers and other sidearms in the Red Army. So yeah, we had the new Tokarev pistol and the new Tokarev rifle. You knew we'd have to come to the good old Mosin Nagant. Even though this is old, at least it did get a facelift with the 9130 before the war. Of course, uh, this had been in Russian service since the 1890s. Millions had already been built. And in World War I, we had three main versions. They had been produced at Ishesk, Tula, and Tsetsaresk. Also, there would be production in France and, of course, in the U.S. The standard version was long, nearly 52 inches with a nearly 32 inch barrel weighing in at 9.5 pounds. But there were two shorter versions, the Cossack with a uh, 28.5 barrel, overall length of about 48.5, and the Dragoon, which was the same as the Cossack except it was intended to mount a bayonet. The idea was Cossack were traditional cavalry with sabers. Dragoon, while they would ride into battle on horseback, were expected to dismount and fight as standard infantry. And I mention this because it was actually the Dragoon model that the uh, new Bolsheviks, the reorganized Red Army, would settle on. In 1922, it was decided to stop making the other two models and just make Dragoons. Okay? And this would be at Ishesk, which had been making them forever, since the 1890s. But also, production was ordered at Tula. So they would start making Dragoons, which I don't believe they had made before. They made other Mosins, of course, but Dragoon started off in Tula in 1923. The next year, a committee was set up to establish a modernization for the rifle, also the 760x54R cartridge. And... Most of the work was done between that time and 1926-1927, but it would continue into the 1930s. And here we have what they consider an ex-Dragoon. This was originally made as a Dragoon, but since really the 9130 was a Dragoon, just updated, most of your... Dragoon guns, or even Cossacks, were given the treatment here. So it's a good, interesting early production. You can tell, of course, by the hex receiver and what have you. The final production run of true Dragoons at both Yashesk and Tula would be from 1930 to 1932. After that, they were full 9130. So what is the big difference? What's the big deal? Well, standardizing on the Dragoon pattern gave us about a 2.5, closer to 3 inch, shorter barrel, which gave us the shorter overall length. Gave us a weight of under 9 pounds. Uh, stock type can make it a little flexible between 8 and 3 quarters and 9 pounds. Still, of course, a standard bolt action gun, including Mosin Sticky Bolt, with a 5 round mag, single stack, single feed. The wonderful Mosin safety. 
One thing they did change with the 9130 though, one problem the early versions had, and even this version didn't completely fix, but the interrupter system wasn't great, so they went to a new two-piece design. Ironically, that interrupter was just designed by Nagant himself, so getting rid of it made this even more of a true Mosin. The uh, Dragoons had standardized on sling swivel slots a long time ago, but that became the standard, of course. And really just production expediencies. I don't know how to really say it. Just, just simplifying the design. We would actually get a new calibrated rear sight quite early on, 1930, 1931, for the new cartridge loading. And then a, just a little bit later, we would get a new front sight around 1932, 33. We would get this style. It's simpler, easier to use, and it would come with a new type of bayonet fitting. So those are the main differences. Even though it's designated as the 9130, the truth is this pattern we know and love didn't really appear until 1933-1934. And uh, one of the changes we should just mention now, in case I forget it, is the, of course, the hex receiver. Ijesk went to the round receiver in 1935, and Tula would switch over in 1936. This is just really, frankly, newer machining technology. It's more of a modern look. The hex receiver is definitely a 19th century look. The round receiver is just, you can tell it's made with newer tooling. And, uh, yeah, the Mosin. Do I have to say more? So, by 1941, the SVT was frontline, but still plenty of Mosins in service. I should point out that, like I said, this has a 48 and a half inch barrel because this is a self-loading gun with the, all this going on this has a 24 and a half inch barrel that plus the muzzle blare break actually gives us just about the same overall length the 9130 is just a hair longer but only about like half an inch not even that the tokarev though interestingly is technically lighter yeah this is like i said about eight and a half pounds and this is verging on nine pounds so hmm, there's that of course this is dependable and simple and just terribly familiar to soldiers but both of these are big and long and while we all do like things big and long not everyone does in 1938 a carbine version of the Mosin Nagant was finally adopted for mass production the M38. Pay no attention to this one being a 1945 example. It stands to point. Now this was not the first Mosin carbine, of course. There was the model 1907 ordered by the Tsar after the Russo-Japanese War, but they did not make many of those. Uh, under 350,000 with many, many lost to attrition over the years or given away as aid. You don't really find authentic 1907s today, unfortunately. But, this is very much based on it. And for whatever reason, Russian military generals were just were resistant to um, carbines in the Imperial era and in the early Soviet era. They just didn't like them. It wasn't part of their doctrine. But finally they had to acquiesce. So, kind of basing on the old 1907, we have the 1938. It has the same... 20 inch barrel or just over 20 inches if you want to be exact and it's got an overall length of just under 40 inches and it weighs about seven and a half pounds the old 1907 was slightly lighter at closer to seven pounds but because this had some of the 9130 updates like the newer sights hooded front the thicker furniture ended up being a little bit heavier but basically it's the same a gun so quite a bit lighter quite a bit shorter and this was intended yes for cavalry but also uh, you know artillery crews signals crews um, reconnaissance runners special forces just basically anyone needing their hands free needing a, a, a personal defense gun but not is a primary thing or someone in a special operations, it wasn't expected to be fighting in an open field. So they weren't 
meant to replace anything. They were just meant to supplement the two above guns. And they did quite well. They were put into production in 1939 at Ishesk and built briefly in 1940 at Tula. Not very many, though. Truly, not much more to say about the M38. It is just a shortened 9130. I would point out, though, if you look at the muzzle here, notice how it's very close to the front sight base versus this. That is because it was not intended to and cannot actually support the traditional, you know, pig sticker bayonet. This wasn't what it was expected to do. The crews that were issued these did have, of course, a shorter range rear sight, too. What have you. By 1941, there were over 200,000 of these in service. Again, the vast majority built at Ishesk. But it's still a much smaller number compared to the other two. But it was um, well-liked, popular. And uh, the pre-war examples, 1939s are quite rare. 1940s, a little more common. But finally, there was the acceptance of a carbine in the Red Army, which would have long-reaching effects. During World War II, the Great Patriotic War, Russia was the largest single user of the submachine gun, but its roots were very humble there. Like a lot of military, especially the general officers, the higher-ups, the old-timers, the boomers of their day, many in the Red Army saw a submachine gun as wasteful on ammunition and not all that useful. However, with the new 762 by 25 Tokarev cartridge, Trials were underway by 1931-32 to select a submachine gun to fire it. Thus enter Degterev's PPD-34. This was selected. It was a little simpler and easier. It was selected and put into limited production in 1935. And it was based on the MP-28. And I do not have one of these, obviously, but I do have this. Another one of the 118 scale guns from that set. The reason it uh, seems like a PPD 34 to me is it does have the short mag. Original mags were 25 round box mags. They would also soon have a 73 round drum but it was a neck drum because originally we had a single piece stock these were in very limited production 1936-37 they were usually given to border guards in 1938 an updated version the ppd 3438 came around had a few simplifications for mass production but when the winter war kicked off in 1939 the red army had just over 4,000 PPD submachine guns in inventory. So not many. So we had the 25 round stick mag or the 73 round neck drum at this point. And we would go from a single piece to a two piece stock with separate 4M later on. Very much your basic open bolt submachine gun again inspired by the German Bergmann. Which to be fair inspired a lot of SMGs of the day and time. But this here, during the Winter War, would further inspire Russia. Finland's KP-31 Suomi. Now, one of the options in my poll over on Patreon for the next nation to look over is Finland. So, if you're interested in more on that, check it out. And this inspired the Red Army in two ways. One, just the Finnish effective use of the submachine gun in general really showed them how it could be used. Two, it's 71 round magazine that did not have a neck. This style of just, you know, essentially cutting away the receiver, having a block. Would uh, greatly inspire them. And the first form it would take, like I said, they would go to a two-piece stock on the PPD. That's because in 1940, the PPD-40 appeared. 
And this was really the first and only major improvement because it went to a new 71 round drum very much like this but without a neck. That's why we lost two cartridges. Also, and maybe more importantly, it was the first Soviet gun to feature a chrome-lined bore as a standard feature. About a 10-inch barrel. Again, very standard stuff. And these would be produced more heavily in 1940 because, again, they kind of saw the utility of the submachine gun in the Winter War. So the majority of PPDs were built that year, and they would do about 90,000, with, again, the bulk being the PPD-40. But it used old-school machined parts, much like the Suomi, and was just time-consuming to mass-produce, had a few other shortcomings. Essentially, they knew they could do better. So it was a, it was a stopgap measure. I will say that production was halted in 41, right around the time of the Germans, and a handful more PPDs were assembled from leftover parts the next year. But that was it. It was an interim solution. It was Russia's first submachine gun, but not its last or even greatest. The Papa Shaw, the burp gun, Spagen's machine pistol, submachine gun. Probably my favorite one of World War II. <laughs> and this had a very quick development cycle. Like I said, the PPD-40 was an interim solution. Still had a machine receiver. Most were made at Tula, although a few were made elsewhere. Now, Spagen had been a member of the revolution. He was a gunsmith. He wanted to build something that was quick and easy to assemble pretty resource forgiving using new technologies that have been put in place at Tula and Ishesk. Early stamp steel or press steel or sheet steel type parts and um, something that could also be easily maintained in the field. So basically not burdensome on the soldier. And well, this is what we got. Essentially it was similar to what had come before but instead of being on a tube it actually is a hinged action here easy access there and of course it used a magazine 71 rounds very much inspired by the Xiaomi's here in fact the only real difference is 9mm versus 7.62.25 so one of them's a little thicker and I will say that the original mags were a little thinner on the steel. Later in the war, they would uh, go to slightly thicker stamp steel. But originally, that was the, the thing. They would actually initially issue these with two serial match 71 round drums fitted to the guns. This was very quickly put in the trials September, October 1940 because they knew they needed to replace the PPD. It did go up against it and quickly defeated it. In fact, it had a 30,000 round endurance test with half of those being on automatic, the other half on semi. It is select fire with the selector here. Has a safety on the bolt. And by November, it had passed the trials, certainly better than the PPD. And in late December, it was recommended for mass production and actually given a reasonably high priority. So the drum and the whole concept and the importance really has the Xiaomi to think. And the idea, most of the parts on here could be built by any machine shop, car shop, auto body. Really only the trunnion and the barrel were specialized gun parts. This, by the way, was a 10 and a half inch barrel, chrome lined. Overall length is about 33 inches, and it's about 8 pounds unloaded. And that's why you'll see manufacturer of the PPSH really spread about several factories. It was very decentralized, originally based around Moscow. But it was going to take time to set up the new stamping sheet metal technology so outside of some trials guns and pre-production guns, these weren't in service with the Red Army by June, July of 1941. 
but he was on the drawing boards. They were just having to switch over. So let's look at a few features. The mag catch is very much inspired by the SVT-40 because, and I've always thought this was neat. That's what I was saying earlier. So I tried to do like this. But I always thought it was neat how it folds itself. Kind of learning lessons there. The earliest versions had a more traditional ladder rear sight, but very soon they went to a two position flip. Like I said, there's a safety on the bolt handle selector and very ease of disassembly by just hinging it open. Single recoil spring, a synthetic buffer in the back. Couldn't make it easier. That plus the chrome line bore made it very good for maintenance. Semi-pistol grip stock with a storage compartment for the cleaning kit. A basic squared off barrel shroud with even built in simple muzzle brake to help with uh, recoil. A lot of thought went into how to make this simple and effective. Pretty much standard sling swivels. Nice large trigger guard for use with gloves. Much like the Xiaomi we looked at, this, this semi-auto was assembled by TNW many years ago now with the original barrel, but of course it's extended out to 16 inches. And a closed bolt. You know, needs must. What can you do? But, yeah, these were waiting in the wings. And even though mass production did not begin until late October, early November of 1941, by 1942, they already had 90,000 production models built. So even though it took basically a year to get production going, once it was, in just two months, they built as many or even more of these compared with the PPD. Now, part of it was just the emphasis and importance. Part of it, too, was this was uh, quite a bit simpler. It had 87 components versus 95 for the PPD, but more importantly, each component was faster and easier to make and required less skilled labor to make. This was the weapon that the Red Army needed, even if it didn't know so before the war. And that's why it became so popular and influential. And that's why I wanted to do it here as we roll past June 22nd, 1941. Operation Barbarossa. Sorry, Barbarossa. I've been talking for a while. Can you tell? I'm also very hungry. Is now underway. And things are about to start changing in a big way. Now, welcome to the story time part, the black box part. Those who follow my Misha channel know these. It's just easier for me to talk this way. And, uh, yeah, I realize when I talk about things like the AVS-36, SVT-38, it would be nice to have photos. Guys, I, just, I don't know how I could do that. I, I can't see photos, and I wouldn't be able to know what I'm putting in. And I really don't know how I could put them in videos, even if I did. Plus, in this day and time of copyright, I'd be afraid I'd end up doing that. So, the best I can say is, you know, Google. Uh, anything that I could ask j Row or Fox to put in a video, you guys can just Google. So, it's just what it is. There's not that many pictures of those out there anyway, because they're just so rare. And that's why I don't have any. Um... Uh, you really don't see any AVS-36. Again, it was a select fire gun. There's a handful of museums. SVT-38s, there's a tiny number in America. Most all of them came out of Finland by inter-arms in the 1950s, 60s. And those were typically reworked by the Finns. Uh, fun fact, I've seen people get Finnish capture SVT-40s and, and think it's completely original. 
they're not. The, the Finns reworked them. They oftentimes bored out the gas ports because they didn't care if they broke the guns over time. They, they, you know, immediacy was the thing, and they were having trouble with them cycling in the cold. So they just opened up the gas ports all the way to ensure reliability with all kinds of ammo. And this is also why your Finnish guns are typically mismatched because you know they just use the parts they had. The reworks, like the one you looked at there, don't bug me. That's that's how they came into the country. It's kind of funny. If you look at guns from the losers of a war, they're often in original condition. But from the victors, like the U.S., Britain, Russia, they would be refurbished and put back into stocks in the 40s or 50s in case they needed them or in case they wanted to give them away or maybe even sell them to allies. As it happens, the SVTs, because they only made a relatively small number compared to other guns, and because of their issues and whatnot, you don't see a lot of other nations, sorry car, with them, but there's a few. Um, uh, Bulgaria had some, I think East Germany did, China definitely had a few, so they, they got out there, but not a whole lot survived the war. As to mine there, you've seen it in countless videos, I've had it 20 years now, and it very well could be my best gun show pickup of all time. And like I said, I, I picked it up, it was towards the end of the assault weapons ban, 2003, 2004, in that time frame. And I used to go to gun shows quite a bit, you know, before the internet was really going, before Gun Broker was a big site. And of course, for me not being able to see, if I'm gonna buy a surplus gun, I, I, I need to feel it. And so I always kind of had a short list of things I wanted to get at a gun show. And at that time, an SVT-40 was on there. I had originally learned about the SVT-40 from uh, Jay Rowe's father, of all things, a few years before that. You know, I'd, obviously I had my own learning period, just like everyone does, and uh, I wasn't really aware of them. I knew of the Tokarev pistol, but when I said something about getting a Tokarev, the first time I did, uh, Jero's father, who's a doctor, so I usually call him Doc, I said, uh, and he goes, oh, the rifle or the pistol? And I was like, there's a rifle? <laughs> so for a few years, I had wanted one, but they were already pretty uncommon. That's because the ones from Russia only came in from about 1992, after the fall of communism, till about 1995, because in 94, there was a bilateral agreement that Russia and the U.S. signed, Clinton and Yeltsin, where Russia agreed not to export military arms to America. And this was really supposed to just be, you know, AKs, Makarovs, things like that. But they accidentally left some guns off the list, including the SVT-40. So they weren't importable. This is also why we saw Russian capture K-98s. They were importable for that reason. So by 95, 96, they were drying up. And by the time I was getting into guns a couple of years later, they were, they were pretty much gone from primary sources. But you could still find them. And prices were starting to go up. I don't remember exactly what they were fetching at that time. It was more that you just didn't come across them. And even when you did, you had to be careful that no one had shot corrosive ammo through them and not clean them properly. Because cleaning corrosive out of a bolt gun yeah, okay. But out of a semi-automatic, a gas gun like that, it is actually very hard to do and do it completely and thoroughly and not miss a spot under here, under there. And that's assuming you even knew you were shooting corrosive and, and cleaned it. So it was on my list, but I was going to be choosy. I walked into a relatively small gun show in a town called Fort Smith, which was about an hour from where I grew up and actually about an hour from where I live now, even though they're different areas. And uh, right there, it was on the rack. There, there was a dealer there, and it was just it was right there, that gun. And I literally picked it up and never, never put it down until I paid. And looked at the price on it. Well, okay, I asked the person I was with what it was. And uh, 19987 Funny, because that was the price that Century Arms charged, including shipping, back when you could get them roughly 10 years before. And the guy had some other cool guns. He had a couple of uh, Finnish M39s. He had an FN 49 with the scope. 
he had a couple of MAS 36. It was all good stuff, and it was all clean. I mean, it all looked like it was straight out of the box from Century because it was. Turns out he had bought out a defunct dealership, and these had been in the back room. This particular gentleman did not care for military guns. He didn't hate them. It just that wasn't his cup of tea. He was more into like uh, pre-64 Winchesters and Colt single actions, guns that I'm not into. So we gelled out really well. Guns that I didn't want, he did, and guns that I wanted, he didn't care about. He just wanted to get his money back out. He saw what the original FFL would pay for him. I'm sure he gave less, but you know, he figured that was a fair price. And I kind of told him, as I can't, he goes, I don't care. And I ended up, and along with the person with me, we probably took eight guns from him, kind of 50-50. And it was a good day. Uh, although the only, only kind of semi-negative of the person I was with almost started to haggle with him for price, and I was literally doing the kicking him under the table. It's like, just just don't. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. $200, here you go. Keep the change. <laughs> Three cents. And um, I was just tickled to death then, and I, it still makes me happy now because all the guns I've had over the years, my very first SVT-40 still today is pretty much the best example of an early production gun you're going to come across. It even has a serial matching mag. Granted, it's an E-pin match, but and granted, it's a force match on a lot of other parts because it's a refurb. I know that. But, that's about as good as you're going to get, and it shoots well, too. I, I've shot it more than a few times. Not a lot over the years, maybe 200, 300 rounds, just to say I've done it. But, delightful gun, and I don't see myself getting rid of it, not until the point maybe I have to go to the old folks home. The Nagant pistol and the Tokarev pistol. The Nagant you see there, actually I picked up locally, oh, maybe eight years ago. Bought a small collection. It kind of cracks me up sometimes you run into these people and they'll go, oh, I've got a big gun collection to sell you. Oh, okay, cool. Well, how, how many guns are you thinking? Oh, there must be eight or ten guns there. And I get it to a lot of people that that's, you know, that's more than you can have in your hands. But uh, this guy, I think I ended up getting maybe 15 guns off of him at most. And uh, that, that, that Gaunt knife I was there, I thought it was cool. Um, it's an earlier import. It, it, had, it came with its leather holster, not the canvas. Um, it's got a lot of honest wear in that one grip side where it rubbed up. But that just lets you know it's it's not a refurb. Those are just smoothly, honestly worn grips. They're not like sanded or nope. They're just that's just how it was. It, it just rode in the holster. I considered selling it several times, but back when I picked it up, those M95s weren't bringing a ton of money more than they had originally. But you know they were still only bringing about two fifty, maybe three hundred for an earlier one. I, to me, it was worth just keeping it in the collection to have a nice early example. I like it. It's fun. I'll shoot it. Um, they they hold together really well. They're one of the few revolvers you really don't have to worry about the cylinder too much on. That, that locking system, the camming system, going up against the forcing cone, unless you've got a severely worn one, the timing usually is pretty dang good on them. As to the Tokarev, I've had a good number over the years. And once upon a time, guys, it was hard to find a TT-33, a military one. When I was younger, you saw the commercial Chinese, like the M54s and, and uh, you know, the what, 219s and 213s. You, you saw those. But military ones are pretty sketch. Uh, there were some Russian ones, and I think there were some Russian ones that came in via China. But then the Polish ones came in, and the earlier ones like mine, the, the safeties were added over there. And it seems like it was a little bit better job than the later ones that were marked TTC, where it has the big clunky safety. Honestly, the safety that they put on them over there isn't the worst. The reason I pulled it off that gun was to make it fit. They also gave it a thumb rest grip. On the left and I wanted to put the original Polish grips back on by the way Polish grips aren't adorned not having the stars correct some of the very very early WZ 33s had like a an FB Radom style logo but they quickly got rid of that so they are correct grips 
but if you want the correct left grip you can't have the safety it is 100 percent legal to pull those off they just need to be on along with thumb rest grips for uh, the points system because of the 1968 gun control act after the polish came in the romanians started coming in and uh, from there we've had quite a few other chokerev imports unfortunately true russian ones have always been scarce again because of certain agreements and things and, and just and, and just politics but yeah that that's a good example not counting the grips and the added safety of um kind of the early style one and i did years ago have an early production one i don't know 1940 i think no safety so it was a bring back of some stripe i i sold it uh it had a not great bore it had you know, the bluing was worn it wasn't really rusty but it was just yeah there was a lot of wear on the gun it was neat but i've had others and you know sometimes some things have to go plus what i really wanted was a uh, late production gun to go with an early one so <laughs> hey ho there you go mosin nagants uh what can i say uh, a9130 although it was a finnish capture and inner arms import because uh that's just what was available back in the late 90s before the big glut came in was my first i think it's a lot of people's first especially back in the day and i'm happy that they're getting more respect now and collectability because they're also a lot of fun I, the the 9130 there was actually one of the final batches it was actually a really clean batch that came in about eight years ago i guess and they were neat because they were ex dragoons or right around that transitional period they were dated somewhere between 27 and 32. Uh, uh, jay got one i kept one yeah they're import marked but i thought it was neat to get the early one even if they're refurbished that's that's what it is i do have the matching bayonet for it somewhere but because I don't want to poke holes in my ceiling all the time, and yes, I did that early on. I think everyone who first owns a Mosin pokes a hole in something at some point, hopefully not a cat. And uh, yeah, so I just don't leave it on. But it's cool to have an example. I I'm not the world's biggest Mosin collector. I don't have every variant of everywhere and every time, but I like having a good example piece. And, and same goes for the M38 carbine that one came from my friend john years ago when he was selling off his collection picked it up noticed it was a 45 pretty clean example doesn't appear to be refurbished and the import and excuse me and the serial numbers are lightly struck but that actually does seem correct for a 1945 uh, ishesque so take it for what you will it's definitely in its right stock i like it i've had several m38s in the past I picked up one when the big import batch started coming in in the early 21st century and even back then the m38s were kind of a cut above um when others were selling let's say for 100 bucks the m38s were 120 150. part of it is they made fewer of them and whereas lots of nations made the m44 not just russia really only russia made true m38s and yeah, they made a couple of million, but a lot of them didn't make it through the war. And they're just, I think because they were meant for a specialist thing, they just, they seem to group a little better. They're just a little bit tighter bores, a little better fit and finish. And um, I love how light and handy they are. If, if you've never picked up an M38, but you have picked up an M44, you don't get it. it it's um, the same length, but it's so much lighter on paper it's only about a pound and a half difference but i think because so much of that weight's out front on the m44 you really notice it with an m38 it just balances really well um actually uh jero's dad doc has a a check reworked 30 uh, 91 38 that i've kind of wanted him to sell me for years and i don't know cool, cool guns no i really like the m38 it's probably my favorite mosin i would say overall I just like the feel of it. Well, which one's your favorite? And concluding this black box section, the PPSH-41, the Papa Shaw. Again, uh, SH is actually for Shaw, 
and uh, different letter than S in Cyrillic. That one came from TNW, and I, I like their builds. The, the Suomi they built was nice, especially when they, when they went to the hammer fired versus the, the striker. They did a good job. It's got the original barrel, even though it's extended out. The kits were available then. These days, yeah, the, the PPSH-41 semi-autos are going for not cheap. Back then, they they seemed expensive, but I guess by today's standards, they're not. They were yeah, about a thousand bucks, but the kits were everywhere. I like it. I had a few come in. I actually picked those up in my early FFL days. I had contacted uh, Military Gun Supply, who, who had as it turns out the, the the contract with them and the owner Dave was nice to me he said well they were actually helping supply the kits to TNW and so it was exclusive but he would put in a word so they gave me a call and they agreed to sell me a small number you know as a dealer and that was nice it was one of the first kind of deals like that ad struck going through channels and um, really like it before that, years before, I had handled and shot a full auto PPSH-41. As best I can recall, it was 100% original. And I kind of fell in love with it then. 7.62 Tokarev was really available for a few years there, surplus ammo. And uh, it just has a look to it. it it's, it's the opposite of a Thompson. That's not to say it's better or worse, but it just has a look all its own. And it's so iconic when it comes to... World War II history, not just Russian, but just in general. And if you're not into that, Korean War and Vietnam history, it, it is it is the enemy submachine gun so much of the time that even if I wasn't going to get a full auto, I had to have at least a semi-auto. And I like extending the shroud out like that. It's noticeable, but it's not as ugly as it could be. And uh, yeah, I really like the gun. It's, it's one of my favorite semi-auto builds. And uh, one I've had long before I met uh, MK Gun Mods, uh, Mac Arms over there. But uh, I really like that cartridge too. It's it's a lot of fun. And do you own one? Because there were there were there were guns before the TNWs. There were the the IOs. The, there were the uh, uh, Wise Light. I'm trying to think of the name. So there's been several companies that have done PPSH 41 builds over the years in America because it's a popular gun and for a while the mags the drums and the sticks were um, very very affordable in fact i got extra sticks and i think extra drums from them when i ordered them mag pouches slings even cleaning kits to go on the buttstock it was the whole enchilada or borscht so with that we wrap up my little talk on the pre-wars but now let's dive into the thick of it. As I said at the end of the first chunk of the video, pre-war, we really didn't have any of Spadrian's submachine guns in full production or service. Although I'm sure a handful were out there doing things. But, and by the way, it is PPSH, lowercase uh, h, just because of the Shaw uh, character in Cyrillic and Spagen versus Stagen, if it were an S. Anyway, moving on. This was already really streamlined for a war, so not much happened. As to who built them, frankly, everyone. <laughs> I mean, they were outsourced, they were, they were moved around. Yeah. Like we already talked about, the rear sight would s soon be changed. It would keep on with pretty much the same stock and everything being issued initially with two mags here's a pouch notice the kind of border leather faux material this is closure a lot of holsters will also go to this pattern so that's what was originally issued but this drum well it gave a decent amount of firepower but for reliability's sake, you can only really load it to about 65 rounds. It was a little slow to load in the field. Um, heavy, of course. So, in February of 1942, they would introduce the stick mag here. For the Spasian. 
Come on out. There we go. 35 rounds. That's because it is a double feed, but still a single stack to fit in the same magwell as the uh, drum. So, while it was, uh, I'll set you down here. Straight in insert, and much easier to produce, more reliable. That single feed would be a detriment, but the good thing was they didn't have to modify the receiver. When the Xiaomi would go to a box mag, they, had, they modified the receiver a bit. Now, like I said, these were introduced in February 42, but it would actually take quite a while for a lot of these to get into the field. They would also, around 43, increase the thickness of the metal for both the drum and the stick mag from about half a millimeter to a millimeter. So, by 43, 44, this would be what would be issued. Typically, you'd still get one drum, and then when that was exhausted, you would switch over to the stick mags, and you get at least three of those. I'm sure some machine gunners would have uh, multiples, but this became the loadout. It was just faster, easier, lighter, better to reload. And keep in mind, 7.6225 Tokarev, out of a 10-inch barrel, with a good stable stock like this, these proved very effective and had very good range for a submachine gun. Of course, this is where the stories of squadrons, even platoons, being equipped with PPSH-41s come into play. They were sometimes used on their own, sometimes used for house clearing, CQB type stuff. And they were also used to escort and defend tanks. As mighty as the tank is, without infantry support, it can become quite vulnerable. So this was a very good field gun. And that's why millions were produced, and it's very, very iconic for the Great Patriotic War. So, how did the war impact pistol production, Tokara pistol production? So, I have that Polish out again, and here is my 1942 Russian. By October of 1941, the Germans were getting dangerously close to the Tula factory. So, beginning in November, efforts were underway to basically uproot the factory and move it. And it would not be the only factory that received this treatment. In fact, a great number were moved further east, many across the Ural Mountains, out of direct threat from the Nazis. And Tula would be relocated to the town of Ischesk. And production would be started back up already in 1942. And that year they managed to turn out over 160 thousand TT-33s and you can tell them because they have a circle triangle arrow combination symbol instead of the triangle or star and this year they introduced some changes they went from the nice Bakelite type grips to just slab side wood grips they attach the same way and of course machining steps were skipped and the bluing went from relatively high polish, dark blue, before the war, to pretty thin gray. Now, of course, this is a Vietnam greenback gun, so it has honest wear and tear. What impressed me when I first got this is how clean the insides are, though. But even when this was new out of the factory, the bluing was done hastily, giving it more of a grayish look than, you know, blackish blue. But they still kept production going. And uh, they would crank out a good chunk during the war. And they would keep doing these grips through at least 1944. And on top of TT-33 production, M95 Nagant production would be scaled up again. It was really tapering off and probably about to be completely suspended at Tula. When the war kicked off, so they first ramped it back up. It was a known quantity. And then, in 1943-44, Ishesk also made some Nagant revolvers. 
ending around 45. The front sight would change a bit over time, and some later guns would go from the birch grips to a Bakelite type, a synthetic grip. But really thanks to how simple the Nagant revolver was already, there weren't all that many shortcuts they could take. The hammer is a little bit simplified. Check rings a little coarser. But yeah, they would be building both types of sidearm during the war. And really as large of a quantity as they could. But of course, this took a backseat to submachine guns and more importantly, rifles. Returning to where we began with the Tokarev SVT-40. When the Germans were coming around, you had Ichask, Tula, and Podosk manufacturing these. And technically, none of them would be making them in 1942. Technically. But only because, yes, Tula would relocate. And so, it's different factory, at least different numbering system. And they would continue from that point onwards, building about... 265,000 in that year. Podolsk would stop. Ichesk would stop being ordered to focus on the 9130 again because they quickly discovered they could build three of those for every one of these. And in the field, the Russian troops were having some issues with them. It was it's a very complicated rifle compared with the Mosin. It, it isn't complicated for a trained army, but, yeah, this is actually one of the reasons the Germans like them so much, adopting them, or at least designating them as the Gewehr uh, 258 for the 38 or 259 for the SVT-40. And they had much greater success, so much so that they borrowed the gas system from the Tokarev rifle, the short-stroke piston, to actually make their Gewehr 41 work, becoming the Gewehr 43, something I've talked about before. But... What's nice about these two, early example, much later production example. Most of the changes here were done to simplify and streamline production. The receivers would change, for example, having the scope rail cuts in the beginning. These would be deleted by 1942 because the whole trying to make this into a marksman gun didn't work out so great. Vertical stringing, other issues. They would build under 52,000 factory uh, snipers. The good old 9130PU would continue to be Russia's frontline marksman rifle well into the Cold War era. A lot of parts would lose their lightning cuts, like the rear sight. The trigger guard, which had been slimmed down to save on weight, would go to the thick style. The uh, shroud up here would change. The two-piece sling swivel up here would go to a single-piece band. And of course, a big change is with the muzzle brake. The original fish gill would be replaced by the much simpler four-port brake in late year. Okay. Pros and cons. Obviously, this saved machining time easier to do. This was a far less effective muzzle brake recoil check. 40-50% less effective. One positive, though, it was quieter. This uh, brake, like a lot of effective muzzle brakes today, was kind of loud. So this was quieter, just less effective at doing its job. So, eh, you win some, you lose some. The shrouds are changed, too. Magazines would become simplified. Far fewer markings on some parts. The bolt would go from being in the white to just a straight blued. Things like that. Now, I really like my 1940 for just being an early example. And I like this one for being a non-refurb or light refurb. But there's another thing, too. Safety. Safety and a third. 
In May of 1942, this version here with the third position was introduced as a substitute standard, an interim solution, an emergency measure. The AVT-40 for automatic rifle Tokarev, kind of borrowing upon the old ABS-36. Yes, a select fire 7.62-54R rifle, already known for being a little fragile and semi-auto, with only a 10-round box mag. There were some experiments with doing larger, but there don't really seem to have been major production, if any. So 10 rounds. Yeah. And, yeah, but this was a way to get a machine gun into the hands of soldiers like that. And as you'd imagine, very quickly they had weird issues. Obviously, it ran out of ammo very quickly. It was not very controllable in automatic fire, especially if you had the later style muzzle brake on it. And you were breaking stocks. Now, this one does have the thicker reinforced stocks, so they did strengthen the stock back here compared to here. Skinnier, heavier. So that helped. Of course, you also needed this cutout for the selector. But... It was very much an emergency measure, so much so that already by the end of that year, orders were given to only use these on Samato. And already by the next year, the AVTs that had been built, when they could, were brought back in and turned back into SVTs like this one. This is not a full auto gun, it just has the full auto selector still, but inside it's Samato. Kind of like the whole M1 carbine situation in America. And also that year they quit doing the snipers, like I said. So they tried out that. It didn't work out. It's just kind of an interesting piece of history. Kind of a little bit like the U.S. 1918 BAR. You know, full caliber, limited mag. Closed bolt, of course. They tried it out. So that, really 42 is the last year to talk about when it comes to SVT production. They would still be turned out from the relocated Tula in 1943, even 1944. But by that point, the submachine gun was coming around. The 9130 was being made in ever-increasing numbers. The DP-28 or DP-27, if you prefer, a light machine gun was coming in larger numbers. Basically, time was passing this by. And actually... The majority of these were built in 1941, about 1 million. In total, Russia would turn out about 1.6 million. So you consider the ones that were built before, the ones in 1942, about 1 1.3. So only about 300,000 were built in 43, 44 total. And production was officially discontinued January of 1945, even before the war was over. And I get it. It was an ambitious project. And in the right hands, um, for example, marksmen, guys who are known for good accuracy or just good rifle skill, were handed these in the Red Army and did well with them. NCOs often got them. Other specialists, the Russian Marines, used quite a few Tokarevs. So in those hands of people that had experience and skill, they did very well. But when you gave one to a conscripted peasant who'd worked on a farm his entire life, maybe even didn't know how to drive a car. I'm not saying he was stupid. I'm saying he was literally ignorant in the true meaning of that word. Handing him a rifle like this, he didn't necessarily know how to shoot it or maintain it. And, of course, we're in 1942, the depths of the war. We need as many rifles as we can get. The Mosin isn't as good, perhaps, but... 3 to 1, that's really good odds, and just less maintenance, plus you don't have to keep it making extra mags for the guns. It just, it fell out of favor by 43, 44, and you just really don't see them. However, it would inspire the next generation of Soviet guns, and it would allow Semenov to kind of come back in again. We'll get there. Oh, one final change that actually occurred in 1944... They went from the sling swivel back here to the slot, like on a moisin. And uh, while not very many rifles left the factory with that style of stock, many received it during arsenal refurbishment in the 1950s. 
So I mentioned the moisin. That's the literal meat and potatoes of the Red Army. I have a real soft spot for wartime 9130s, or as I've always called them, oh shit, German Mosins. And they really were able to get production up. Again, Ishask was the primary maker of these, but others did as well as too. And the original 91 and whatnot took over 40 hours to make per gun. The 9130 cut this down a good bit, 30 some odd hours. But during the war, by skipping some machining steps, some final checks by using different materials, and just by increasing the workforce, <laughs> it's amazing how when there are enemies on the doorstep with guns, you can speed it up too. It was down to 13 hours, so nearly half a day to make one of these at the peak, which would have been 42, kind of into 43, towards the Battle of Kursk. And this is mine. You've seen it before. Nothing real special. You can see the chatter marks here. This side had to be relieved to let the safety lock on, but this other side didn't. So we get the so-called high wall receivers where they just stop machining them there for a while. Not a lot of changes per se. Just, yeah, skipping machining steps, coarser, rougher machining. And of course the stocks would change too. But these are both refurbed guns. I will say the original liners were pinned in. These are lined. Later on they would go to the press and discussions. But during the war, they'd do this. Bring out my M38 again. The front would just get a bottom liner. You had to put some metal there, otherwise it'll crack through because of the sling. Excuse me, because of the sling ratting there and then the cleaning rod. But in the rear, it was not felt necessary. So it was just a straight wood cut. I should also mention the use of laminate stocks. Even though most laminate stocks we see are actually post-war, the idea definitely dates to the war. And it did save some resources and make a stronger, if also heavier, stock. And they would go from using some brass to steel or even just other alloy pieces here and there. Again, just kind of a far less pretty look. But that allowed them to crank out millions upon millions of 9130s, and they would keep making the M38. Going back, not many were made in 1939. 1940 was a relatively low number, under 170,000. You get to 1941, they make over 400,000 M38s. And 1942, this increases. 43 is the highest year production for these. But still under a million made that year. But then, in 1944, it falls way down to about 160,000 again. And this one's a 45 dated, which no one needs, really knows the production numbers for this year because they were just kind of turning them out, using up the parts they had. So the peak of this would have been kind of the peak of the war too, 42, 43. And I've always had a soft spot for the M38 carbine, too. And, of course, there was the 9130PU, the sniper. Production of those was increased when it was quickly determined that the SVT-40 sniper just wasn't going to cut it. And this would continue both the 9130 and the M38 till 1945, really forming the backbone of the Red Army. You know, 17 million or more were made and crazy numbers and just a, a key part of U.S. collecting for 20 years as well. So that kind of gets us through what's, there was existing designs before the war. The Tokarev rifle, the Tokarev pistol, the Nagant revolver, the Mosin Nagant, and even the Papa Shaw, the PPSH-41 technically was designed and tested and approved before the Great Patriotic War. But war always breeds innovation. So let's end the video, the last half, by looking at, well, innovations. And back here, I thought it was important, even though this is a shorter section, to really break 
the early war from the later war because from the second half of 1941 through really the first half of 1943 Russia was really very much fighting for its uh, own existence not getting political not mentioning the whole thing with uh, allying with Germany originally not uh, getting into the invasion of Poland that's really not the point the point is thousands of Russians were already dead innocent civilians who did nothing wrong to anyone women and children included millions were fighting millions would end up dying <clears throat> so breaking back with the PPS H41 it's interesting just to look at the economies but since it was so produced for the war in the first place not a whole lot could be done and uh, there, there are a lot of little tiny manufacturing differences if you look at parts kits from here and there and uh, whatnot. As for the handguns, yeah, the, the M95, that's actually my original one, the very first Nagant revolver I ever bought. And I remember they were $79 if you got one, or $74 if you got two. So one day was someone bought two and we got some ammo. And uh, even back then, the fact that it's its own cartridge, 7.62 by 38 rimmed, it really kind of kept them back. Back then, I was trying to still buy guns that I could shoot, and I wasn't a big revolver collector. But I'm glad I have it. It complements the other one quite well. Not a whole lot to say about it. The TT-33 there, though, yeah, that, that's a legitimate Vietnam bring back. As I alluded to, even though the outside's got some old wear, old pitting, honest stuff, the grips are remarkably in good shape. And when I took it apart for the first time after getting it, the insides are clean. They're well greased, well oiled, well maintained. So even though maybe the jungle and even World War II got to the outside, the people that had it before knew that their life could depend on it and they kept it well maintained, including the magazines. It just has a great been there, done that look. And when it comes to unmodified Russian Tokarevs in America, beggars can't be choosers. And I, from the get-go, wanted at least one example with the wood grips because that to me is the iconic World War II one, made from 42 through 44. Yeah, that, that's the one you see. I, I really do like it. And that's why I kept it. And that's why I sold my earlier example with the black grips just um, suits me better and the wear and tear is honest it's got a story and that's why I like these things I like the story behind the guns and my second SVT 40 even though at one time it was an AVT 40 and again it's perfectly legal it's it's kind of like with an M1 carbine versus an M2 just not not having the full auto parts is what matters and that's how it was imported and I picked it up several years ago now but I got it because it was a non-refurb or one of the light refurbs out of Eastern Europe. I think Bulgaria was mentioned, maybe somewhere else. No one really knows exactly, but they came in some years ago. And as someone who was a really expert on Tokarevs helped me with it. And I, I waffled on buying it back then because it was considerable money. Uh, it was... I think 2500 maybe even 3000 my ultimate rationalization was <clears throat> that I got such a good deal on my first one my refurb one my 1940 that I could kind of splurge on that one to get it legitimate I liked that it was a later production with later features I didn't even know it had an AVT uh, selector on it until I got it but um, yeah, these days I'm really glad I did because when I cost averaged them both out together, it seemed fine. <clears throat> and now refurbished ones are going for nigh on that. I had one up on Gunbroker recently. I think I had a buy now of 2800 on it, and it sold immediately within with, within a day, under a day. And even at that, I had guys multiply calling to, to do it. I didn't have a chance to even get them in a description of so absolutely no regret 
and I like that it not only does it exemplify the later style one but it also shows the very ad hoc very wartime example there of a select fire version which I think they knew was a bad idea but they had to try something I don't know what to say I really like the Toker of rifle and it's an often forgotten about part of World War II history and really goes to show you that Russia from the 1916 Fedorov onward in some ways had been at the forefront of self-loading or select fire rifles. Ah yes, my wartime example. I uh, picked that one out of a batch. It's a refurb. It just came in with standard guns, but I, I was looking for a 42-43 gun. And I love the chatter marks on the receiver. Even the bolt handle is like off center, off shape. The barrel's got all kinds of lathe marks, especially if you take it out of the stock. It's unfortunate that, that it's a refurb and a and in, you know more of a later style stock. I do wish it had its original World War II stock, but I'm sure it was long since replaced and destroyed. It, it, again, I got it from the importer, and I've looked at other guns to replace it with to try to improve it in the collection. But I've just never found another 9130 that's just quite as rough on the machining front. So when I did it, I kind of selected rough machining over the correct stock. Um, it is what it is. And it goes, it's, a, it's a correct stock for a refurbishment gun. And again, as rough as those guns got, and as quick as they were able to start turning them out the factory, they still worked. And they were still perfectly accurate. I mean, no more or less than any other mass production. As with Japan and Germany late in the war, Russia in 1942-43 knew the steps they could skip and the ones they should not skip. And again, the story is there with that gun. So between that and the much better looking X Dragoon, I'd probably sell the X Dragoon first. I just love the look of that corn cob gun there. It's rough as they get. But if I find a rougher one, machining-wise, not condition-wise, I'll probably switch it around. But I haven't done so yet. But I wanted to make this as the, uh, the desperation section. There's not really a whole lot new development at this point in the war. But that, that will change. And, uh, of course, 1943 is a, is a pivotal and, frankly, turning year for the Red Army against the Wehrmacht. In 1941, right as PPSH production was ramping up and the Germans were coming over, the Red Army voiced a need for a more compact, lighter, even more resource conservative submachine gun. At least they'd like to have one. And that's how we ended up with this, the PPS-43. And its position was a little uncertain at the beginning, but it found a place, so much so that a few people, including Mikhail Kalashnikov, considered it the best submachine gun of the war. Was it? Mm, probably for its intended role. And it was kind of following that trend like the Sten, the Grease Gun, even the MP40, of using stamped steel, few resources, no elegance, just get it together, put it out the door. And work began really in 1941 because we had some early prototypes by April, May of 1942. The PPS is named for Alexei Sudev, but it was really based on an older existing design, at least to some extent, but he greatly simplified it and streamlined it for mass production. And it's very closely associated with the siege of Leningrad from late 41 through early 44, 900 days, because these were primarily built at the Setsaratsk factory there. And they began with the PPS 42. Like I said, we had some prototypes in the spring of 1942. By July, it was accepted as the PPS 42 for limited production. They were setting up production, and the first true production model PPS-42s came out December of that year, running through January as they ramped up. And, um, well, yeah, they were definitely used against the Germans there. 
So what do we have? How does it differ from the 41? Both are open bolts, or at least the originals were. These are both some autos, of course. Whereas the 41 was select fire, the 42 and later 43 were just full automatic. But in exchange, they had a lower cyclic rate from upwards of 900 rounds to around 600 rounds. It had a top folding stock versus a wood stock. And it fed from a new pattern of magazine. So the 35 round mag for the 41 inherited the single feed because of, of the compatibility with drums. But the 42 and 43, we have a very similar magazine body, although it is simplified in construction. And it is double stack, double feed. Because this was not meant for a magazine or drum mag. Because we have this, the magwell, which makes insertion quick and easy. And it also serves as a foregrip. And we don't need a folding mag catch because it's protected here. I will say that only about 46,042s were made already by the spring of 1943. They were working on a replacement. This is the whole thing that you see with Soviet production, like the TT-30 moving into the TT-33. Same thing is happening here. They liked what they saw in the Red Army, but they wanted they wanted it a little stronger. They wanted to simplify it a bit more, a few things like that. So with the 43, it's actually a little bit shorter. The 42 had about a 10 and a half inch barrel. This has about a 9.7 inch. They unified the whole top piece from here to here to one stamping. Of course, being a sim auto, it's actually back to being two. But the 42 we were two pieces to begin with. Now this is all just one piece of stamping. They improved the safety, making it where it would physically lock the bolt and trigger group. Um, they changed the angle of the magwell to improve feeding. They changed the stock latch to make it stronger. Things like that. So, the version they ended up with, it was accepted in July of 1943. It is uh, about 32 inches with the stock deployed, about 24 with it folded, so quite a bit more compact than the 41. It's also lighter, whereas this was about 8 pounds without the magazine in it. This is uh, about 7 for the 43. The 42 was about 6.5. Uh, again, they strengthened it a bit. And it was even more resource conscious than the 41. So the Ev's gun used no wood. We had synthetic grips. And the steel was mostly stamping or just rolled sheet steel. And even at that, it was not precision fit, so it didn't have to be exactly cut. And it wasn't riveted except exactly where it had to be, otherwise they just used spot welding to hold it together. So the technology that was really designed for this would carry on later for other Soviet manufacturing. Simple 200 or 100 meter flip rear sight, you know the deal, adjustable front, a basic muzzle brake, here, of course, it's still firing 7.62.25 Tokarev. And um, this actually used half the steel that the 41 did. And it could be made in under three hours. When they really got production up and running, not much more than two and a half hours. Because all you had to do was cut the steel, weld it together, boom, Bob's your uncle. The bolt in what is effectively the trunnion are machined of course it has a barrel but everything else is just straightforward very simple trigger group stamped safety stamped disassembly catch again pre-made plastic grips the mags are just stampings too typically they would issue six mags per gun so three in two three cell pouches giving it a pretty good uh, firepower so these were in full rate production by the latter half of 1943 and 
were a pretty common sight by the last year or two of the war. The early 42s were tested against the Germans everywhere, Leningrad especially, and also they were sent to Finland. And the reason I can say this is because when you look at Finnish inventory, they had captured quite a large number of PPS 42s, at least considering relatively how small the production of the run was. The 43 would soon replace them, and um, these would go to reconnaissance crews, vehicle drivers, vehicle crews, uh, other types of scouts, uh, messengers, some special forces, just anyone who needed something lighter and more compact. And for the day and time, a gun that could fold up to be exactly two foot long, but still have this level of firepower, I mean, this is nearly a 10-inch barrel with 7.62 Toker, that's not bad. And even though it wasn't select fire, it was reasonably controllable. They tried to do bursts of, you know, 30 to 50 rounds at most, and hold it on target, and the muzzle brake helped. The only thing was, by the time the PPS-43 was really in full production, the PPSH-41 was well established. So, it never it replaced the 41, it never really was meant to. It was just a supplement. Hey, here's a, a different type of submachine gun, here's a different way of doing it, and of course, being built near Leningrad, in, really in Leningrad, it gave them a gun that could be produced with whatever steel they had. So it definitely occupied a place. And as I said earlier in the video, Russia was the largest single user of submachine guns in the war. You had over 6 million PPSH-41s, 2 million PPS-42-43s, plus some Thompsons and other guns that were Lend-Lease, meaning that and of course some PPDs, so over 8 million submachine guns in use by 1945-46, by the wartime being over. And I think the 43 here is just important because it shows Russian experience with stamped steel, welding, rolling steel, and magazine design. The double stack, double feed mag is important. And it really was a very dependable gun and very economical and, uh, yeah, well-liked by the soldiers. And honestly, probably safer than the Sten gun because of the selector or the safety here, the way it locked the bolt. Pretty advanced top-folding stock, I would say, compared to, like, the German MP40. This is a better stock. Easier to load magazine than the U.S. grease gun. So it was definitely one of the most advanced submachine guns designed right in the middle of World War II, and really right in the middle of the Siege of Leningrad. So, very iconic. We return to Mosin talk. Yeah, right around the same time the PPS-43 was being adopted and being put into full-scale production, thoughts were underway about what to do about the Mosin. There really hadn't been much in the way of R&D, excluding the PPS because of the emergencies in Leningrad, in 1942, there was a bit of a uh, freeze because, well, we're relocating Tula, uh, you know, oh shit, Germans. But by 1943, after Kursk especially, but, it, you know, it wasn't the only decision, uh, dis you know, decisive point in the war. The ideas for the next level guns were, were coming around. And starting with the humble Mosin, this M38 that a lot of people didn't want was actually proving pretty great. Lighter, shorter, had enough range. They were kind of worried about fireballs and recoil and sound, but eh, it wasn't too bad. So, in 1943, the Ishesk Arsenal did a trial run of about 50,000 pieces that were effectively M38s, but with a bayonet assembly. And this really was an assembly. It's part of a collar system, a unit that goes on to the end of a muzzle. It was designed by Seaman. Seaman. And really didn't require much in the way of changing the rear of the gun. And all you needed to do was inlet the stock for it and extend the barrel slightly. 
Like I said, the M38 has roughly a 20 inch barrel. This is roughly 20.5. So there's just enough room for the ring to go around the muzzle. As you can see, you know, there's just enough room for it to go over. And of course the stock has this groove cut in it, especially back here. And that's really the big difference. Um, this one has the reinforcing bolt. Some of these could have the laminate stock, but most had the hard wood birch. Early ones would have the half escutcheon up here and slot back here, but later on they would go to the Preston style. And these were sent for field trials and testing. And the reports back were good. So in 1944, the M44 was accepted, adopted, and authorized for full rate production. And this is a Mosin, so they know what to do. Typically, this would have a heavier overall feel. Like I said, the M38 was eh, seven and a half, a little more pounds. This, depending on the stock and a few other small things, was uh, between eight and three quarters and nine pounds. So almost as much as the 9130. But the reason they wanted a bayonet assembly was for close quarters fighting. And because they were considering this as the first carbine to ever be adopted by Russia, Imperial or Communist, for general issue. This would be what everyone got. Yeah, a 20 and a half inch barrel gun. So that's why they wanted the bayonet assembly, just to make it a little more universal. The, they just felt like it had to have it. So take it as you will. So Ishesk would slow down their M38 production. This is why 44 is a very low rate year. And they would tool up for M44. Now, if you think you're special for having a wartime M44, you're not. They made over 3,600,000 in 1944 and over 3,400,000 in 1945. So roughly 7 million out of a total production of about 7.8 million. The others were made between 46 and 48 in Russia. Pretty low rate years, 150, 170,000. Didn't matter. So I'd also point out that Tula, in 1944, would make a final batch of M38s, probably using leftover parts, and make a batch of roughly 100,000 M44s. But this is also the time Tula was going to relocate back to its original position, so their production was curtailed this year. And by 1944, especially after D-Day and all that, with the second front opening up. It's only a matter of time now. But no, the M44 was very much in full rate production. Now, I should mention that even though they were making them, not a whole lot got all the way to the front because by this point, the Red Army's on the offense is marching west, so it would take a while for these to catch up to them. I'm not saying no M44 served in World War II, they definitely did, but not in huge numbers. You had some old SVTs, plenty of 9130s, lots of PPS H41s, yeah. But after the war, for a time, this would be the Red Army's standard issue infantry rifle. I think it's pretty cool, even though I still like the M38 more. Well, while we're on the subject of Tula's move back to its original home, the TT-33 by 1945-46 would get a, a new old facelift. The kind of wartime machining and bluing would already have been transitioning back to higher quality. The wood grips would disappear by 45, even late 44, going back to the starred Bakelite types. And one interesting change that doesn't seem to have been in production until after the war, but immediately right after, the uh, slide serrations. We went from this style, large, 
to this much finer style. And that's due in some part because of more advanced tooling at Tula after the war. And this gun is an example of a immediate post-war. Unfortunately, it does have the added safety. A shame these could not have been imported back when the, the trigger dingus was allowed like today, but, you know, hey. It's still a Russian Tokarev. And it does have a working half cock on this one. Yeah, I have this one in the collection just to show kind of a later style TT-33 from Russia, which is very, very similar to an early style, which is why I actually sold my 1940. It was in worse condition, and it looked the same except for the slide serrations. And uh, TT-33 production, much like with the M44, would continue, although at a lower rate post-war. And that would be that. And it would remain the standard pistol really until the Makarov. In fact, the M95 Nagant would not be taken out of production until late 44 or early 1945 itself. Sooner or later, to really tell the complete story, I had to bring, of course, the MP44 back out. Although it wasn't directly this that began this change in Russia. It was actually the MKB-42 experimental gun. Russia captured a good number of them by 1943. And more importantly, and this is what's often overlooked, what was really important about this was the cartridge. 8 by 33 7.92 curves. Also... M1 carbine from America, 7.62 by 33, because it actually predated it. Russia saw the utility. After they were allowed to kind of start R&D back up in 43, they saw that most combat was, you know, under 300 meters, a lot of it even under 100 meters. The intermediate round was cheaper to produce, much lighter, more controllable and automatic, and it was intermediate. It wasn't a submachine gun. It wasn't a rifle. It kind of cured a lot of the problems. One of the biggest problems with the SVT was the cartridge. And one of the problems with the PPSH and PPS was the cartridge. Although, not as much. So, in November of 1943, the initial specifications for 7.62 by 41, were released. And already by the spring of 1944, there were upwards of a dozen concepts or prototype designs on the boards to chamber for it. Because Russia, they wanted to go really in on this and have a whole family. Out of the four firearms design requests, the most conservative was a bolt action. Chambered for 7, 6, 2 by 41. It would have looked something like this, just an M44 or similar, but, well, smaller cartridge. And it never really passed the concept stage, the drawing board stage, because it was the security blanket. It was a, if it doesn't work out, we've at least got this. But it was turned out it just was not needed. Next, we need a self-loading carbine, or longer rank uh, rifle if you prefer, for 7.62.41, to replace the SVT. Keep in mind at this time, late 1933-1944, this is still nominally in production at Tula. So, this actually comes to an interesting series of trials and Yet another head-to-head -head between Tokarev and Zimanov. I'm fudging a bit here, but I'll get to exactly why I pulled this out in a minute. Even before the German invasion, there were actually plans for another round of trials for a self-loading rifle, still chambered for a 454R, 
to be held beginning in July of 1941. In both Tokarev and Simonov had designs ready to go. The SKS-41 and the SKT-41. But neither happened because the Germans. Now, this would be Simonov's really perfected design. He would go on to make the PTRS-41, the anti-tank rifle, which really got him a lot of acclaim and probably saved a lot of Russian lives and prematurely ended a lot of German. He was awarded several prizes for this. So by the time the trials were beginning for the self-loading intermediate carbine, yeah, Simonov was had really made a name for himself. Now, interestingly, they had gone away from the detaching mag idea. I've said it before, it was mostly Stalin's, but it could have been others too. Regardless, by 1941-42, even before these trials, the Russian powers that be had made it clear that they wanted a fixed mag. In fact, Simonov even showed off a couple of concepts, one five round, one ten round, back in 1941. So that would continue here. He basically just took his design in 1943, scaled it down for the new cartridge, and found out this works really well. The intermediate round feeds even better than the Tokarev round, or excuse me, the 762 by 54R round on the Tokarev, and it's definitely helpful that it has a recessed rim or is a rimless round, if you prefer, which either way. And of course, it was just much better and it settled upon roughly a 20 and a half inch barrel based on the m38 m44 that general length even though they had experimented with barrels as short as 18 inches before so why did i bring out the albanian this doesn't look like the early sks pre-production and prototype guns but the longer three vent handguard is a little reminis reminiscent of Simonov's later designs and the spike bayonet. Like with the M44, that was what the original SKS had. So it was ordered into limited evaluation production. Keep in mind, this is a very new cartridge in 1944. And reports are that a small test batch was trialed out on the Belarusian front. And a few of them even marched their way west and participated in the Berlin campaign. But we're talking small numbers, guys. It's just experimental. Nevertheless, it was adopted as the SKS-45, Simonov's carbine self-loading model of 1945. So technically, it was adopted in those magical wartime years, even if after the Victory Day. But of course, production would be delayed for several reasons. After the war was over, well, Russia had to redirect its economy towards rebuilding and peacetime efforts. It was pretty impoverished. It won the war, but at a great cost. And on top of that, for a brief time, there was not an immediate threat. Of course, after 1947, especially the Cold War was heating up and... They didn't know what was going to happen. So finally, by 1949, the SKS-45 was put into production at Tula. And it would remain in production until 1958 there. Very little unchanged. After 1945, Simonov had a few years to really tweak the design, get it going. So once it was put into production in the 49, yeah, mine's a 50 here. The biggest change between this and a 49 is they went from the spike bayonet, the pig sticker, to the blade, even though it was a blued blade or a blackened blade originally. Still, Simonov's short stroke gas piston has a tilting or tipping bolt, fixed 10 round mag. Very high quality. Ishes would make these very briefly in 53 and 54 as well. And they just really didn't need guns right after the war, too. They had plenty of Mosins. The M44 was in the production. They had millions of other Mosins. Even the SVT-40 wasn't officially retired until 1955. They still had 
you know, quite a few of those, and PPSH and PPSs. But it fulfilled that slot in the uh, table for uh, the self-loading carbine. And again, I don't have one from World War II, or uh, no one outside of a museum would, but it's kind of funny that the Albanian has a few throwback features, even if they were maybe just accidental. Number three in the family was a single-man portable light machine gun chambered for 762 by 41 and I don't have a DP-28, but I do have this again, another scale one. Notice the record player magazine, little bipod. Yeah, something to replace light machine guns like these. Maybe a few SG-40 three gory knobs as well. And that too would officially be adopted during the war, although not put into production until afterwards. And that would be the RPD-44. Another design from Ditiev. Like the PPD. He was a pretty prolific designer. He designed this too for what it's worth. You kind of notice that with Soviet arms makers. They all have their day, and for a minute, it seems like everything comes from them. And then some new upstart comes along. So, that was what came in. It was a belt fed, one of the very few intermediate caliber belt fed guns ever put into full production, which actually would lead to some of its issues and why it was replaced in 1959 by the RPK. But of course, I saved the most important for last. The fourth and final member in this plan was not just to you know, copy and customize the 8mm Curtis cartridge, the animated cartridge, but also give a Russian take on its rifle. And a lot of nations would take this, especially you know, Warsaw Pact, to replace some machine guns. And, and in part, that, that is where it was going to slot in, after all. We've used the intermediate cartridge to replace mostly the 762 by 54 r but it should also be able to replace the 7.6225 Tokarev round. So, yes, in some ways this was the most ambitious because it's not just a one-for-one -one replacement. We're, we're, we're doing this new class of gun. Okay, Germany pioneered it, but Russia was right on the heels. And part of me wonders if this wasn't because they were one of the earlier adopters of the self-loading rifle at the very beginning, too. Plus, they just saw its effectiveness. They, you know, real-world situations and real-world combat, having captured plenty of German guns and ammunition and eventually German engineers and designers, too. And while the PPSH-41 doesn't have a lot of impact here. It would be kept in production. By the end of the war, they had built nearly 5 million. Production was ra wrapped up in Russia in 1947 at 6 million, as I said. It was actually the PPS-43 that kind of pioneered Ford. Suthiev was really the first Russian designer to make a new assault rifle for the cartridge. And it was put into limited production as the AS-44 in, well, 1944, running through 1945. And it used the kind of basic, simple, sturdy stampings and rolled steel construction of the 43 here. But it was a, you know, locked breech rifle. And it's hard to say what would have happened. Because in 1945, Sudeev died... And his design, while it had some promise, ended up being, you know, a dead end because of that. Later on during testing, the AS-44 was kind of used as a, a standard. And troops decided that they liked part of it, but it was a little heavy. It needed further refinement. And fortunately, like I said, his designer wasn't around to do it. But, his understudy was... Mikhail Kalashnikov. He had 
read Fedorov's book, undoubtedly studied the Tokarev system, actually had a very good relationship with Simonov, who taught him a lot, and they had almost like a big and little brother relationship, and he worked under Sudev, which probably explains partially why he was so fond of the PPS-43. And he kind of picked up the torch from there. He'd been working on designs, some machine guns, since 1942. In 1945, he had his own. And that, of course, would be the AK-46, which actually resembled Sudiev's work quite a bit, including the hinged upper and lower and what have you. But the reason we have the 47, the concept, was actually because of the switch in cartridge. 76241 would be turned into 762 by 39 at the end of 1946. This was done to ease manufacturing and also improve feed and performance and, you know, just, just tweaking it a little bit. And this is actually how Kalashnikov was able to keep his design and rework it so much between the 46 and the 47. And, of course, he had worked at the Kovarov arsenal, working on it, and it would go into production at Ishesk. And because it would replace the PPS-H, there was a fixed stock version, and because it would replace the PPS-43, there was, from the very beginning, a folding stock version. And the... Russian concept for the assault rifle came from here. And you can really see the lineage thanks to Suthiev. And of course, thanks to Hanel in Germany and the 8mm Kurs cartridge. And I've pointed this out in several videos, but just to be absolutely clear, Kalashnikov had nothing to do with designing the 762 by 39 or 762 by 41 cartridge. Those were designed by the state and designers were told to you know make their guns for them and that kind of gets us up to the ak and hands it off to other videos that i've done covering it but it does show how this grew out even though it really wasn't the first assault rifle in russia chambered for the cartridge that would be the as-44 even if it was very limited production you know credit where credit's due but of course two of the guns from this program would be Russia's frontline rifles in the 1950s, and the RPD would be one of its frontline light machine guns in that era, too. Quite a successful concept, dating back to the middle of 1943, right after Kursk and other major battles in the war. And really, I would say, you know, Simonov won his thing with Tokarev. But then Sudiev, by the way of Kalashnikov, kind of outshone them both. But eh, that's, how, that's how it goes. And that is Russian small arms of the Great Patriotic War. And our third and final black box section. What to say, what to say about the... PPS 4243. It is a neat, neat little gun. Often, frankly, rightly, but still, unfortunately, overshadowed by the PPSH 41. And some think it was meant to replace it. I'm not sure that in the very, very beginning in 1941, it may not have been thought that the specifications could, but obviously, by the time it was in production in 43, it wasn't going to happen. Now, for years, the only thing we could do in America was were, were parts kits built. Either it was a pistol or a carbine, although most would do a pistol because you could just, you know, weld the stock closed and it looks right and those look a little strange with the extended barrel. I've seen them, though, including using the extended shroud, so it's a thing that was done. And uh, SMG, the company, Rick, he was doing the builds until those IO guns came in, which were amongst the earlier Pioneer guns, PAC, brought over by them. And um, I've, I've told this before, but I was really one of the very first dealers to get them in the country, more just by virtue of location shipping, and I had been kind of a part of that. And um, 
it was neat because they they used original parts kits barrels included with a rear section a repair section that was new by pioneer we didn't really know who they were back then and the trigger group is of course some automatic only the bolts are original but they're uh, converted to closed so i i was very excited to get one went out that day it was weekday it was getting towards dark went to shoot it and brrr, yeah it went full auto because they didn't put a strong enough spring in the firing pin and uh it was uh it was igniting like no one's business so i immediately called them told them there was a quick recall i sent back my bolt and my recoil assembly and uh, they they swapped them out now the one you saw there is actually a later import my original gun from that time i actually converted into a pps 4352 that you've seen in other videos so i actually have two of them keep in mind when those came out they were a great buy even if you know pioneer arms about it it was okay because they were 300 dollars, and that came with the three or four mags the cleaning rod so not bad of course over time they've gone up and up but when they came out that was a i remember i, I waited for so long like 10 months for them to come out i was very very much waiting for those unfortunately even though they talked about doing a ppsh 41 import i think because they really didn't have a good way to bring those over as a pistol it just um it never happened sadly talking the m44 mosin they're neat i i Again, I like the M39, uh, M38 more, but you almost have to have an M44. What's funny is the Russian ones are more common now, but prior to the big import of those, you could actually get Romanian, Hungarian, and Polish more easily. And uh, I actually had a really nice Romanian. Even back then, the Polish ones sold for a little more. I remember very clearly the Romanian was 80 bucks. The Polish was 110 at the store. But then the Russians came in, and uh, you know, we wanted those, but then the other ones disappeared. The Chinese Type uh, 53s were hard to get back then. They'd become a little easier over time. That just That's the nature of surplus. But that's mine. I have no particular special connection to it. It's just, you know, one I picked out. It's in good shape. I kind of like that it's got the reinforcing bolt at the wrist there. It makes it a little unique. But, uh, yeah, you kind of got to have one. And it does have the early bayonet assembly. Later ones, they changed that up a bit, especially when to produce for other countries. But uh, I've done a couple of different M44 videos in recent times, so I won't uh, dwell upon it here and now. And I think I've really said all I need to say about the whole 762-41 or 762-39 intermediate cartridge story. This is also why I like the SKS. When I was younger, people viewed SKS as a, as a knockoff AK, and they, they, did, they put a lot of effort into making them look like an AK. To me, it was always a World War II style gun. Yeah, they were made in the 50s or later, but it, it feels like a World War II gun. And in, in my mind, it, it's basically an honorary one because it was adopted in 1945. I've always thought they were cool. I've always tried to have a Russian in the collection. They always sold for a little more. I know way back in the day, they were about the same price as Chinese, but very quickly the Russians took a little bit of a premium. Nothing crazy, but they too were banned from further import by 95 for the same reason as the SVT-40s. Yeah, I just really like them. I really do. And the Albanians are just weird and cool. Uh, I think one reason I've always wanted to have an Albanian and tried to always have one is because they do in some way remind me of the SKS-41 and just the, that early Simonov uh, look, if that makes sense. I don't know. But uh, the whole story there. Uh, what else can I say? I, that, that's how I view guns is, is a continuum, as, as a story. Because when you really put them neck to neck like that, you can see where they went from the, uh, you know, the Burdan rifle, the, the 91, through the Fedorov, through the Tokarev, to the Simonov, to the Kalashnikov. And they all build upon each other and everything is logical. And then you involve other nations. This inspired this and that inspired that. The Russians inspired the Germans with the Gewehr 43. The Germans definitely prompted the Russians with the cartridge and the MP44 and all that stuff and I, I love the narrative of history. I think sometimes people when it comes to studying history get too caught up in the 
proper nouns, the names, and the exact dates and all that. And they miss the narrative. They miss the story. If the story is there, you can interest people. And when it comes to Russia, the story can be many things. Brutal or tragic or inspiring in some cases. It's never boring. It's never dull. Since the days of like the, the Novgorod Chronicles and the early days of Kiev Rus through today, say what you will about Russia today, and I've said a lot in my personal channel, it's not boring. Hard to forget about them. And I really like how the weapons from the Great War immediately transition into the weapons of the Cold War, which themselves have transitioned into the modern guns like the AK-12, AK-15, the RPK-16, and, and later things. Uh, it, they, they're all connected, and I love that. And that's why I'm, I like doing these overview videos to kind of give the broad strokes, if and where possible. With that, though, it's late. I'm tired. Let's wrap it up. And there we have it. You know, everyone thinks of Russia as kind of being backwards with the Mosin Nagant, and they certainly leaned on it very heavily, and it was certainly an old design. But we have to give credit to the SVT, even the AVS. Very ambitious, maybe a little more so. But the problem with those in the Red Army had just as much to do with the caliber and the training as it did the design itself which, again, is evidenced by how much more successful the Germans were with it. But, of course, the backbone was the Mosin. The 9130, the 9130 PU, the sniper, the M38, and the M44 was the last major version or variant adopted into Russian service and is actually very important for being the first carbine of any kinder type to be adopted by them for general issue. The PPSH-41 was a fortunate fluke. It just happened to be the right gun at the right time for the Red Army. Luckily, Spajan was forward-thinking as a soldier and, um, you know, knew what he's doing because the PPD would not have cut it. And then what Sudeyev did yeah, it made a smaller, lighter gun, but I think it's thanks to this that we had Russian technology where it was at, with the stamping and use of steel and synthetics, holding stock. Even though far fewer were made, I think it was very important. And then the sidearms. Nothing revolutionary here. Belgian design, copy of two Brownings melded together, but they got the job done. Both were very solid and dependable. In fact, even though production would finally end with the Nagant revolver with about two and a half million made in 1945, they would stay in service with uh, police, some reserve military units for decades, even into the 21st century, like railway authorities and a few others would still carry them. And the Tokarev pistol, too. It was officially replaced by the Makarov in the 50s, but in reality... These hung on for a lot longer because at the end of the day, it was dependable and it was a very powerful cartridge. If you notice, everything is still a 30 caliber bore here, which just eased production and all that for Russia. But yeah, I wanted to do this overview. Like I said at the beginning, there might be a short break in between this video and our next range videos. It just kind of depends on circumstances outside of my control, but it won't be a long break. It's just, um, you know, like I said, a lot going on, but all's well. So what do you think, Russian history and what have you? Feel free to share your own guns, your own stories. Check out my US video if you haven't. Check out any of my previous videos if you'd like an even deeper dive into the history of these, especially with the MP44, the Kalashnikov, the SKS, the Tokarev. Yeah. And as always, if you could, please like, share, and subscribe. And as I said at the beginning of the video, I've got a poll up on Patreon, so if you'd like to 
vote on which one of these I do next on a rainy day. Uh, sign up and, and do that. Anyway, wish everyone a good week. This is Misha, and I will be back very soon next time.